Hey everybody, it's your girl Bunny, to all of my returning subscribers. Hey, how you doing? And for those of you who are new to the channel, welcome. Kick your feet up as I give a recap of the Netflix original docu-series, Tiger King, episode three, entitled The Secret. Just when I thought that this series couldn't get any more interesting, it just ramped it up by five. Y'all stay tuned, it's coming up next. It's Bunny. So we learned that Carol Baskett's maiden last name was Lewis. This was her name while married to Don Lewis. And a lot of people within the big cat community, they're saying that, wow, you know, his disappearance is just weird. It's so odd that it seems as if it's a lie. But how else can you explain or, or describe how a man just went completely missing, a millionaire? And, and then on top of that, there's no evidence and there's no proof. We see Gladys Lewis Cross, Don's ex-wife, who said that the last time that she saw him before he went missing, he told her over and over again that he wanted a divorce from Carol. He didn't feel safe, that she was crazy, to stay away from her. And he also told his two daughters the same thing. Stay away from Carol. She's crazy and I don't feel safe. Wendell Williams, who is actually an associate of Don said that, yeah, the last time I saw him, he talked about how he wanted a divorce. And after that, I never saw him again. We have John, a lead homicide detective, was in a unit that was also responsible for missing persons. He said that he received a typical missing adult report. And when they receive calls about that, they really don't go into a panic or assume any foul play. They kind of get an idea that this is an adult, he's away, he's not missing, let's just go ahead and start collecting information about this missing person. And within the first week, they started to suspect foul play because the details weren't adding up. We learn a little bit of back history of how Carol and Don met, and they met in a pretty weird way. So Carol was 21 at the time, and Don was 42, 22 years her senior, and he was married at the time with two kids. And while Don was driving, he saw Carol pacing back and forth, clearly heated and upset about something. And Carol explains that she was married at the time as well, and she got into a heated argument with her husband, and she went outside, and she was walking, and she was upset. So Don saw this and kept passing by her in his truck saying, hey, you know, get into the truck, let's talk, calm down. And she just kept saying no. And after the third request, he says, look, here's the gun. You can hold it to me if you think I'm crazy. Just get in the car. We need to talk. So she says, as I'm holding this gun up to him and we're talking uh, because I didn't trust him, they end up going to a hotel to have sex. Don tells his wife about Carol and lets her know that it, she's leaving them for Carol. We have Ann McQueen, who is Don's executive assistant at the time, and he tried to introduce her to Carol to loosen up, and Ann says, you know, I, I kind of liked her at first. She was okay, and but, you know, Don wasn't the greatest person himself. He didn't have the best personality. So we have Joe that goes into this explanation of like, you know, Don was a millionaire and he didn't like Carol spending all of his money. And he goes into this video where he says, I have Carol's diary. And you know, he read it on his platform about her experiences with Don. Now they didn't say how he came up on this diary, but maybe it was public evidence. We don't know. But he goes into the evidence and he's talking and speaking about ex excerpts from Carol's diary. And Don as his personality was explained that he didn't dress up a lot. He wore shorts and he wore jeans, but for some strange reason, he always carried a $500 bill in his wallet because he could. And he was always in the realm and always had a knack for making money. Anything he did, he sought out some way, somehow for it to have a lot of profit. Kenny Farr, who's Don's handyman, said that 
you know, his net worth could be $20 million, but nobody knows his exact worth. Nobody really knows that. And he would hide money, gold bars. He would bury physical money. Family, lawyers, associates all give estimates about how much money he had and what his net worth was, but nobody could give an exact amount. Some people said 20, some people said seven, some people said five, but Don had money and Carol didn't. We learn a little bit of back history about Carol and Carol grew up very poor. She says that at the age of 14, she was raped by two men at knife point in her neighborhood. And when she told her family, they thought that if that had happened to her, she clearly must have done something that was asking for it. So she left home at the age of 15 and she married her baby's father at 17. At 20, when she uh, went and left to be with Don, she left her husband as well. So Carol and Don, they're together, and they slowly start buying exotic animals at auction. And they started a company called Wildlife on Easy Street. And it allowed people to pet animals and take pictures. And Joe is saying that the same thing that she's upset about everybody else doing, we learned that she started out her business that way. So for her to say that the exotic cats that she's has or our rescues is a lie because since the early 90s she bought and sold these pets the thing that she's going after us about we see a homemade video that carol made giving details about how to collect exotics how to domesticate them and just pretty much what everybody else is doing and don and and carol they had different mindsets about everything that was going on and of course don is going to see everything from a business perspective and profit so they really started clashing on things that they disagreed about and that laid over even more to other existing problems that was clearly already in the marriage. Don had another girlfriend in Costa Rica and Carol thought she would be the only one and Don's ex-wife said that Carol thought that her being young and pretty was enough to change him but that's impossible because when we got married at 16 and 17 years old the marriage was okay. We had our two daughters, but there was always things that she would hear in the neighborhood. Hey, I saw your husband and he's with somebody else. That was constantly something that she always dealt with. He was the ladies man and that's just something that he did. So she said for Carol to think that he would just change um, was odd to her. Business associates confirmed and also we see documentation that he wanted to set up his divorce in such a way that Carol would be left with nothing, no money, no cats and houses, cars, nothing. He wanted to leave her with absolutely nothing. And Joe continues to read excerpts from Carol's diary and it quote, and he reads it and says, if he leaves, I'm left with nothing. I wish there was a way out for me. And uh, McQueen, she recalls a day when Don came to her with a very strange look on his face. He seemed kind of worried. And he hands her a piece of paper and says, keep this just in case anything happens to me. And when she read the paper, it was a restraining order he filed against Carol. And it reads that, his handwriting said this is the second time when Carol was so angry enough that she threatened to kill me. She has a forty five revolver and took my three fifty seven and hit it. Uh, the daughters explained that their dad stayed away from law enforcement. He didn't believe that law enforcement should be involved in anything that anybody does. Um, and he had his reasons. So for him to file this and go to a judge to get this reviewed is this big, huge red flag that there was clearly something wrong and that he was worried enough to take this to the courts. And unfortunately, a lawyer explains that the claim doesn't show any evidence of arguing, a fight, and they categorized it as a, quote, no direct threat. And saying someone has threatened to kill you is freedom of speech. And in America, we don't punish that. We punish punish after it's already done. So we see the handwriting as the judge 
uh, categorizes it as hearsay, uh, which is just very strange. And the daughters say that the restraining order was in June and he went missing in August. We see a news report that a local millionaire has vanished without a trace. We see Carol giving interviews, the footage from back then, and she says, you know, he said he was going uh, to load a truck and then he needed a truck to go to Costa Rica and he was leaving early, early. He kept saying early and that was the last I saw of him and I wish I knew where he went. And I'm watching this and I'm thinking, wow, she doesn't show any sadness, any tears because I mean, if you're married to somebody, even if you have some trouble, I'm guessing you would at least still be deeply concerned and oh my goodness, my husband is missing. But she didn't show any sadness, any anxiety. It just seemed like she was just giving a normal interview willy-nilly and not really caring too much. The friend, the handyman, recalls that when he spoke to Don, the last time that he spoke to Don, Don said something very strange. And he said that if I can pull this off, it would be the slickest thing I've done in my life. And his handyman thought that was pretty interesting. Why would somebody say something like that? And he said something like that not too much longer before he went missing. Anne said that she received instruction and it was her responsibility to get vehicles ready. But when she kept trying to get in contact with Don on further instructions, she had no answers. She just kept trying to get more and more answers. And Carol asked, asked her to, you know, look into it and he's missing. And do you think I should call the police? And Anne's just telling Carol, like, yeah, we need to call the police. And he was missing for a day before she called the police. So the police found a, an abandoned van at a private airport. And his handyman is saying, okay, if you wanted to leave without a trace, why would you leave this van at the airport, clearly indicating that you've gotten on a, a plane and, and left. It doesn't make any any sense to me. And he thinks that the cops did a terrible job in investigating because the van was brought to another street and no one even looked in the van, uh, wanted to do research about the van. And it stayed there for days before anybody considered even looking at the van or collecting any type of, of fingerprints. Uh, the detective thinks that somebody placed the van in a different location and that it wasn't reviewed on purpose. And the mechanic thinks about it and says, you know, the police came to me because they found my fingerprints in the van. And I explained to them that, yes, my fingerprints were on the van because Don came to me to, to do some work on the van. And he said, hey, why don't you come with me to Costa Rica. Go ahead and just let everything go and come with me to Costa Rica. And, you know, of course, the mechanic couldn't do that. So the detective says that there might have been something going on and that eventually the moving of the van was just really, really suspicious. There was this floating idea that maybe the plan was to eventually move all of the big cats to Costa Rica and all of his belongings, but they did surveillance on that area and there wasn't any movement there wasn't anything being loaded or anything changed for days uh the assistant um says that you know to go to costa rica he would he would fly a commercial when he would go to costa rica and the mechanic says well you know he flew planes all the time but the size of those planes are way too small to fly that far um, and it was confirmed in the in the documentary that if he took that little plane, he would need to make four fuel stops. And making all of those fuel stops and the checkpoints of planes, you would easily be detected and people would eventually find out what you were doing. And there's no documentation and there's no record of that. And detectives confirmed that there was no record of a plane even taking off, uh, something leaving, reports of flight, or anything like that. Carol goes into an explanation of, you know, he will go to the Gulf of Mexico sometimes and he doesn't have a license, but his license wasn't up to date. And he had several plane crashes. And the last trip that he took, really, he really, really hurt himself. And he would have these episodes of memory loss. And my staff would tell me that, hey, you know, he's showing early signs of Alzheimer's. 
And the friends and family, you know, when they, they heard about this comment, they're like, no, he had no signs of Alzheimer's. This man was all sound and mind. He knew exactly what he was doing. He knew about what was his money. He knew what was going on. So the fact that somebody can even suggest that he had Alzheimer's is just, just crazy and out of this world. And we see footage of Carol with certain shows painting this picture of her being this damsel in distress emotionally worn wife consistently just just being disrespected and 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 just just beaten up on by this sadness of a cheating husband and then we see footage of joe and his music video here kitty kitty and he has a carol look-alike that looks wow exactly like her indicating that Carol is feeding her husband to the tigers. And Doc thinks that this video is just hilarious and the song is hilarious because, you know, it's a good guess up on Joe's part about what happened. Um, and to him, it's, it's what makes sense. And Joe goes in to explain that when you feed a tiger, their stomachs are so acidic that you could feed them a turkey and no bones will come out. Everything will be digested. Um, and he even picks up a key point that in the evidence, his own kids ask if they could have that meat grinder tested for DNA. But the sheriff's department wouldn't do it. They wouldn't allow it. Um, and so there's even more skepticism with that. And then there was an idea of many people saying, hey, you know, she, he might be in that septic tank. And Joe is saying, I, I bet anything that he's in that septic tank on that property. But nobody could get permission to go in there and look in there. And Joe is saying, I bet anything that that man is in that septic tank. Within the investigation, the detective explains that when there's a murder, when there's there's a missing person, they always go to the people who are the most closest to the the person in question, the wife, the mother, the assistant, anyone. And the two main suspects were Anne McQueen and Carol. And Anne says that, yeah, I knew a lot about his financial situations, documentations, where things were, but I cooperated. I gave them any and everything that they needed, stuff about money, stuff about him, his personality, who he was. So I, I gave them everything that they needed, and I had nothing to hide. Whatever I knew, the, the detectives knew. And what we learned is that Carol's brother works for the sheriff's department. And many people think that he looked out for his sister in this investigation. But Car Carol claims that her and her brother are so many years apart, and they don't really have a close relationship like that. When we go into later footage, the detective explains that there is on record when Don went, went missing, she went to Albertson's at 3 a.m. to purchase, purchase um, milk, a milk product for the cats. And when she does that and coming back, her car breaks down and she calls her brother and gets a ride back home after her car breaks down. Then hours later, she says that's the last time she saw her husband before he went went missing. And the detective says the timing was off, but every time, time I tried to get deeper and deeper into it with investigation, he could only go so far. And he felt that investigation just wasn't done well, but him and his position and his role, he could only do so much. So that was a lot of red flags um, with him as well and it was well known that Carol's dad couldn't stand on and whatever Carol needed her father was there um, with anything when it came to building things um, for the campus cages anything that, that she needed he was there and <clears throat> the last little bit of information that is interesting is Anne recalls when she got a call because the office alarm had gone off after Don went missing um, the locks on the gates had been broken. The locks on the office had been broken. The power to the trailer was off and the power to the sewer was off. So we have Kenny that's there, Carol and Ann, and of course the police, because this is her office and the alarm has gone, gone off. She says that the paperwork that was under her desk was two wheels 
and two power of attorneys in which she is the power of attorney of that documentation. And she says that that paperwork was taken. She doesn't know who has it or where it went. And what's interesting enough is that the power rights of attorney on the paperwork had been changed to, quote, in case of a disappearance. And the lawyer that we see speaking on this docu on documentary says that is really, really strange to have within your will in case of disappearance. Why was that change to that after the documentation was removed from Ann's office? And he says, you know, when you write your will, you know, we all, you know, know one day we're going to die, unfortunately. But to have that specific changed in there to that was really, really strange to him. And he didn't understand why it was changed to that. Carol legally declared him dead after five years. So after five years, she could declare him dead and get a death certificate. And the family recalls that she got rid of anything that reminded her of Don. And the property was put in Carol's name. So we don't have evidence. We don't have a body. And the family says, I just found it really interesting that she never had a memorial, a funeral, a Remembrance Day, anything. And when the interviewer asked Carol, you know, why no memorial? Why no funeral? And she said, well, you know, when I received his death certificate, that was the closest thing, in my opinion, that would have been a memorial. So we learned that the kids got about 10% of the estate and the rest went to Carol. Because towards the end of the episode, we see Carol's hus husband, which is confirmed as he's, that's Howard, and he says that she's reasonable, the most reasonable, rational person that I know. And we see photos of them on their wedding day. And they seem to be very happy. Kind of odd, but they're happy. And Carol makes this video about how becoming rich is a science, whether it's on purpose or by accident. And the family did some interviews with Inside Edition years ago. And they got a call from Carol to stop the interviews and stop what they're doing or whatever they have will be taken away. And since then, the ex-wife, they don't, haven't spoken to any other outlets because they were afraid of her and anything that she had. And then we hear a narration of Joe's voice saying that I'll take her on. Everyone else is afraid of her but me, but I'll take her. And then that is the end of the episode. I could guess a lot of stuff in this is this episode. And this really is a cold case that needs to be reopened. The fact that there is a brother that works for the sheriff's office is already conflicting. The fact that there wasn't maybe another county that maybe could have stepped in and helped with some of this investigation. It seems like it was really swept under the rug. And when you got some connections, one can speculate and guess that that has something to do with it. The fact that Don... Uh, made these comments about going to Costa Rica, that could be also something that we may need to consider. This man may be alive and well in Costa Rica for all that we know. And that comment um, allegedly to the friend saying that, hey, if I get away with this, it'd be the slickest thing that I've ever done, throws up some red flags on both ends. Could this ends? Could this man be alive in Costa Rica with the woman that he was uh, supposedly had a girlfriend? Or did Carol have something to do with him being missing? Her history, her feelings about men and family also tie in with that. The rape, the family not having her back, her having this sort of dis despise of men and not really caring. It could go deeper psychologically to explain how things could have and would have happened. Let me know what you think. Subscribe, hit that notification bell so you don't miss any posts. And also follow me on Instagram at the same profile name, official bun underscore E. Leave comments. Let me know what you think. But try not to spoil it for anybody that has not yet seen this series. I want to make sure that everybody gets all of the shockers at once and all together. Y'all have a good one. Until next time, I'll see you for episode four. Bye.